This will be our 10th lesson in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be in Ephesians 1, verse 10. I'm taking my time as I plot through this because of the foundational teaching that is in this first chapter of Ephesians. It's, uh, it's not common. It's not found exactly like this anyplace else, although it, all of this is in perfect harmony with the rest of Revelation. But it certainly does teach us how to develop our kingdom values and how to look at things. We're going to look tonight at what is called the dispensation of the fullness of times. <clears throat> now, if you could properly classify things, what would you consider most important? What you ought to do or what God has purposed to do? Which would you consider most important? I'm not asking for an answer. I'm just saying, you have to think in this manner. Because almost inevitably, people think what we ought to do. They think that is the most important thing. And they'll give them, they'll engage in a diligent pursuit. What should I do? What should I do? And I will tell you that that's not a bad desire, but if you limit yourself to that, you will end up in left field. It's a, it's a sort of thing that you've got to know when to stop thinking about yourself. You can't stop thinking altogether about yourself. I mean, that, see, that's the complicated, <laughs> that's a complicated factor. You just can't ignore what you should do. But at some point, you've got to be able to take that whole body of thought, what you are to do, and set it in the context of what God has purposed to do. And when you do that, it, it, it takes the pressure off of you, so to speak. Because I'll tell you that you'll never reach the point where you're satisfied with what you're doing. There's always that stretching forward posture that you're the reaching forward. There's always that posture of the people of God. If you were to remove, you take, if you were to take Christianity as we know it, Christendom might call it, and remove, take out of it every emphasis on every ministry that had to do with what people do or what they ought to do. If you were able to do that, you really wouldn't have much left, if anything. I mean, it's just startling. When I ponder it, it's just actually kind of startling. You know it down in your soul, but when you actually start to thinking about how little is being said about what God desires, not what God desires for you. We're not talking about that. There is a desire, God. This is the will of God concerning you. There is that, there is that perspective in Scripture. But it is not the fundamental one. At some point, it's got to be that what God purposed to do, and then you build your entire life around that, what that is. Very important. Even if you, if you were to take away everything that has to do with what you should do, and we don't advocate doing that, understand. This is a, this is a hypothetical statement. If you were to remove everything that had to do with what you should do, there'd be a lot of things that'd still be left in the kingdom of God. Right. I'll name a few of them. We'd still have God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the holy angels. They'd still be there. We'd still have the gospel and the promises and fellowship with Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit. There would still be reconciliation, atonement, justification, cleansing, faith, hope, and love. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge would remain with the scriptures, the body of Christ, together with the everlasting consolation and good hope. The names of the elect would still be written in heaven. The new and living way would still be open. The new covenant would still be in place. 
We still have the blood of Christ, the word of Christ, the grace of Christ. There should be the cross of Christ, the riches of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. See, circumstance can't remove any of those. Now, I've said that to say this sound doctrine is built around the things I just mentioned. If you build your teaching around anything else, I mean, it won't be right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, there's a lot of other detailed teachings in Scripture. I understand that. There's a lot of practical things that it must be addressed. I understand that. that those are all in Scripture. But those cannot be the stress of what you teach and what you preach. Once you see it, it seems rather simple, but if you don't see it, it, it seems rather, <laughs> rather difficult to, to perceive. But the awareness and persuasion of these things that I just mentioned, that's what's necessary to work out everything else. You've got to have that. That's the bigger light. That's the sunlight <laughs> that makes everything else make, make sense. Now, what Paul's doing is he's, he's bringing out those things. That's, to, that's exactly what he's doing. In other words, he's brought the big flashlight, mm -hmm. the big light. Mm -hmm. He's brought the big light to shine that illuminates a lot of other things. Yeah. You can operate with a pin light. You know, they have, I've got some flashlights you can put in your pocket. They're this big. Mm -hmm. you, and they'll, they'll put a little beam of light. You can find your keyhole in your car, you know, and, where your house key is, it's, there's lights like that. They're literally, you have, they have some utility. Mm -hmm. but I mean, if you're taking a trip, you don't take that. If you're walking in strange territory and you, there's a, wild animals and poisonous things and you don't take that kind of light, you, got, you want a bigger light. All right, that's what Paul's doing. In life, a lot of people live with this kind of light. You want to find out, is this right here? Should I marry this person? Should I go to this school? Should I? I'm not saying these things are wrong. I'm just saying <laughs> this is not how you, you, how you live. You've got to live with a bigger light, a bigger illumination. That's exactly what Paul's doing. He's taking the, the large illumination, and he's showing it for the Ephesians to see life in a bigger bigger perspective. See, once you see things from the right perspective, a lot of things don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Jim. Even those who focus on a small light, as you say, will admit that life is more than that. That's mm -hmm. right. Just just on a horizontal level, it's more than that. And of course, the Apostle Paul yeah. is talking about the light from heaven. Yes. The, the sunrise from on high that has come to us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's something about Focusing on lesser things, it's it's almost like a addictive because it makes you think you're dealing with important things, and in a sense, in a sense you are, but in a sense you aren't. You're dealing with incidental things, and incidental things are always resolved in the context of greater things. So you got to get out of the incidental situation into the greater things, and then deal with the whatever it is like of circumcision if you just deal with scripture if you just say we're going to look up all the scriptures on circumcision you wouldn't come up with the answer you could never you could never have resolved that situation and it rose up in Acts 15 you must be circumcised after that Moses if all you did is look up the scriptures on circumcision you couldn't have resolved that and that's not what they did. They, they dealt with the greater truths, and then they, they saw the truth of it. All right, our text is uh, Ephesians 1.10. It's a part of this long sentence that we're dealing with. And that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. <laughs> now that's part of all he started out with, all, the, all things 
given us all. He blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He started out with that. And he named all these things he did. Now he's telling you why, why he did all of that. It's in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now this is a language of purpose. This means God's doing something. And everything that he does is moving toward that direction. The greatness and uh, extensiveness of God's salvation is affirmed by how long it took to set things up to, to kick it off, so to speak. <laughs> when Jesus came, then the, we got down to concentrating on the work. Yeah. Up until this time, we were just announcing it and preparing people and telling the way things were. But when John the Baptist announced Jesus coming, the work was going to get underway. Yeah. And the rest was just preparatory. It was basically announcements. Mm -hmm. There was some work done, but it was, uh, it was nothing to compare with what was going to be done. So this is a language of purpose, why God is doing this. And really, given even our own life, we can testify that nothing really substantial happened until Jesus moved That's in. That's exactly right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, the intricate involvements that God has with men, and they are, they are a lot, they declare that something more is involved than just giving man a fresh start. Now, a lot of people, this isn't bad, what I'm going to say, this is not bad. They want to be, have a fresh start, a renewal, so to speak. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But God is infinitely interested and infinitely more than you having a fresh start. That's right. mm -hmm. There's a lot more to it than that. You may have a fresh start, but if it isn't concluding something, it doesn't make anything. I think there's a lot of people who have had fresh starts. There's like drunkards that have quit drinking 30, 40, 50 times. There's people that have bad, bad habits, and they've quit them who knows how many times and had a fresh start, but that's not... That's not what God is interested in, just merely a fresh start. So a fresh start must not be stressed too much. It can't be eliminated, but you can't stress it too much. He remains fundamentally true that there's one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. That is to say, what God is doing pervades everything and everybody and every circumstance. What God is doing governs, governs history. It determines what's going to happen. And your conformity to that purpose determines if it's going to happen to you. <laughs> See, so that this is a language of purpose, dispensation, of the fullness of times. Now you notice that first word there, that. We would say in order that. In other words, this is why he's done all the things that he's mentioned so far. Other versions read, with a view to. So he did this in his mind. He's thinking about what we read about the, the the uh, dispensation of fullness of times and gathering together everything in Christ. That's what he's thinking about when he gave us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. <laughs> that, that is what he was thinking about. Not just you having a, a kind of a smooth trek to glory. It wasn't that. Another version says, to be. As he did this to be, or that this might come to pass. Or as a, there'd be introduction to this other purpose toward this or in regard to this was the purpose or God's goal so God worked with this in mind over here alright now if a person is identified with Christ and he doesn't have this in mind that God's talking about he's out of sync yeah. with God even though he may appear may appear to be very disciplined very godly very holy but if he's not in sync with this that we're going to mention tonight He's he's off the he's out of the beaten path. He's not on the way. He's not on the straight and narrow way. This is where the straight and narrow way leads. Yeah. See, the straight and narrow way is not an end of itself. 
a strict, disciplined life is good, but it's not the best. Yeah, yeah. It's not. That's not what the way is. Not just so you can be, so you can be held in from what's doing what's wrong. All of it. That's not it. It's that where it leads that is the point. It's where it ends up Amen. that is the point. Yeah. It leads to life. There's a philosophy in the world that says it's not the destination. It's the journey. Oh, it's yeah. the journey, well, yeah. That's the right. church. That's yeah. right. right. I don't understand. And so yeah. they want to make the journey comfortable and pleasing and satisfying. Mm-hmm. And, it, and they but, don't talk about the destination. That's right. See, that's what they want when they speak about what's, what does this mean to us now. Yes. They're uh-huh. thinking about the journey. That's right. The journey is important, uh-huh. but the journey is, is nothing without the conclusion. Yeah. In fact, it's a waste of time. It's like wandering in the wilderness. If you don't end up in Canaan, what difference does it make how long you walked in the wilderness or how comfortable you were in the wilderness or whether you had food every day in the wilderness or not? If you don't end up in Canaan, the whole thing was for naught. Just look at this word, the dispensation. (coughs) This word... Aaron has told us about this also. It means that administration. But I want to comment a little bit on what that means. Other versions read that administration suitable. The dispensation, the fullness of times, that administration that's suitable for what I want to do or to put in effect or a plan or the ordering, that'd be the management of the plant, the government, how the thing is, how the process is governed, or to finish the plan. So the dispensation, what it's talking about, this is God's management of his purpose. He's administrating the purpose, bring, working in you to will and do of his own good pleasure. See? And what God is, God is working to a certain end. The only question is whether we're involved in the work or not. That's the only question. Is he working in you? That's the question now. See, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. What is he working in you? This purpose that's going to come to pass in the fullness of the time. He's getting you ready to blend in with what's going to happen at the end. If you're not ready for what happens at the end, everything you've said and everything you've done has been for nothing. And it will actually be a means of condemnation. Mm-hmm. There'll be people who think they've done a lot. He'll say, I never knew you. Yeah. Uh-huh. I never knew you. You have been working iniquity. Mm-hmm. What did he mean? You weren't, in, you weren't involved with the, what I was doing. Mm-hmm. You were out of sync with it. In other words, God himself is going to manage and bring to fruition what he has purposed. That's what the dispensation is. It's talking about God's work, not man's work. And a dispensation, like we talk about the old dispensation, the new dispensation, what we mean is what God was doing of old time, what God is doing in the new time. That's what we mean when they say that. The dispensation is a period of time in which God himself is accomplishing something. That's the dispensation. That means that divine provision for all of all spiritual blessings is not the point. It leads to the point. It's a, it's a difference, isn't it? It means that choosing us in Christ was not the objective. It was a necessary prelude to the objective. It means that being predestinated unto adoption was not the end of itself, but the means to an end. It means that being made accepted in the beloved was necessary for this purpose to be fulfilled. God is administering in accepting you in Christ. You can't be part of this conclusion we're going to talk about unless you're accepted. And you can't be accepted unless you've been predestinated to be adopted. And you can't be predestinated to be adopted unless you're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
And you couldn't be chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world if, there, if he had not provided for all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. See, it's all leading to this, to this conclusion. Redemption and forgiveness are not the end or the conclusion of the matter. We have redemption in Christ Jesus, even the forgiveness of our sins. Why? Because that's needed to, re to develop this purpose that he has that we're going to read about. For that purpose to be fulfilled, you've got to be redeemed and your sins have to be forgiven or you can't be part of this. And you can't be redeemed and your sins forgiven if you haven't been predestinated unto adoption. And you can't have been predestinated unto adoption unless you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. See how God's God been worked. All of these are God's work. That's right. It's his administration. Yeah. He's bringing it to come to pass. Yeah. Making known the mystery of his will. No, it said making known to us the mystery of his will. That isn't, the, just, that isn't the end of the matter. You haven't realized the purpose of God if you just heard the mystery of his will made known to you. It's necessary for you to know the mystery of his will if you're going to be part of this conclusion, mm -hmm. part of this objective that he's going to establish in the fullness of time. The fullness of time means there's something, it's going to terminate. There's an end of the journey. Mm -hmm. There's an aim that's going to be met by this great salvation. There's something going to be accomplished by it, and it's not accomplished yet. But it's going to be. But, yeah. but God is going to have to be the one that makes all these things come to pass mm -hmm. and works all these things out. Mm -hmm. Speaking on a practical basis, the Great Commission is not the real objective. Yeah. And people that teach that it is are just plain wrong. And you can't make it right. Mm -hmm. No amount of stress in it, red-faced arguments can't make it right. The purpose God has is not the Great Commission and it's not to win souls, even though both of them do take place. They're not the purpose. They're not the engine. That's right. They're not what should drive us because uh -huh. they're not what drives God. Yeah. What drives God is his purpose. He's involved us in it, in the, in the reaching people, preaching the gospel to souls, teaching souls, so forth. He's involved us in the preparatory work, but the aim just isn't to win a soul. The aim just isn't to make a church member. The aim just isn't mem mem to teach someone so they know a lot. The aim is to get them to be part of this concluding process that's going to take place in the fullness of the time. So it speaks of arriving and a pointed end. As when the sun, he came, the fullness of times is, is like an appointed end. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came, he came in the fullness of the time. Mm -hmm. He was made of one and made under the law. So when the time was right, here Jesus arrived. Mm -hmm. In our text, there's another time that's going to be right. Mm -hmm. And when that time comes, God is working. So you'll be ready and part of that. Elsewhere, this fullness of the time would be called a self-same day. Mm -hmm. Israel came out of Egypt the self-same day. That was the time God appointed to come out. They came out even though they'd been in there for 430 years, 400 of which were spent in bondage. Yeah. They came out. The aim was get out of there. And when that time came, uh -huh. they came out. There's a time, God's another time, a final time. God is appointed. He's going to tell us what's going to happen when that time comes to pass, and he's working toward that objective. Amen. Elsewhere, go ahead. Moses, he thought it was the time 40 years <laughs> yes, too that's soon. Right. <laughs> that's but right. he found out 40 years later it was the right time. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Elsewhere, this fullness of time would be called appoint, the appointed time. That'd be the same same type of language. The appointed time, as mentioned several places in Scripture, at the appointed time, Isaac was born at an appointed time. But see, it's God that did what was necessary to get to that appointed time. And the plagues happened at an appointed time. And Job spoke of his appointed time. <laughs> when he, he knew there was a time when he wasn't going to be here anymore. He didn't know when it was, but he knew 
And he knew God had to do, for him to be ready when the appointed time came, this required an administration, God's administration. God had to do something. See, this is why a religion that takes you away from God is so serious. It's why spiritual Babylon is, is, what, is a whore. It's why she is. Because she teaches people to live in practical alienation from God. Thinking that they're right because they do this or that. In other words, they've taken the administrator out of the administration. And the, this salvation can't be administered unless God administers it. And he, of course, has made Jesus integral to the whole process. Now, there's a time appointed when God's grand objective will be completed. When all the preparatory work has been completed, the bride will be ready. That's just the way it's going to be. The bride will be ready. The wicked will be reaped. The righteous will be reaped. Even the time, at the right time. That God's going to, something's going to happen. It's all going to happen. There'll be no further need for the world when the time fullness of the time comes. So then all things are going to be made new. The old is all going to be gone. The devil is going to be cast in the lake of fire. Death and hell itself will be cast into the lake of fire. And all things will be new. Now if a person is not ready for that time, when they leave this world or when Jesus comes, there is no hope now of being saved. Mm -hmm. That's right. There isn't any. Because if a person is not ready, they haven't been involved in God's work because God's getting them ready. Yes. That's why he supplied all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's why he blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. This is why he did it. Yeah. He did it to get us ready for the grand time. Amen. Referred to it as a living hope because it's actually doing something in you yeah. as you anticipate the end. That's right. Amen. See, the purpose is that for God working in you, that's but you being aware of it, that's that's the that's where you get it on the blessing. You knowing that it's God is working in you to will and do of his own good pleasure. All right, now what is this grand purpose? This dispensation, God managing this whole process to bring something to an appointed end he sums it up a rather unique way that he might gather together in one all things in Christ <laughs> now talk about a summation that is, that is a real succinct summation I'll tell you how would you state the purpose of God if you didn't have this, like, how would you state it? <laughs> the ultimate and grand purpose that drives everything. What is it? It's an assignment that's too challenging for men. You couldn't, you, if God didn't tell you, how, how you couldn't come up with this answer. No way. You could study scripture. You could study the prophets. But you could not put this together. If God didn't reveal it, see, this, he revealed this to Paul. That's the point Paul's going to get at it all through Ephesians. He's going to keep bringing this up that God made this known to him. God made known this objective. You can't get this anywhere else in Scripture. You can't. Once you know it, then you can kind of piece it together when you go back and see Moses and the prophets. You can make, kind of make sense out of it. But if that's all you had was Moses, the prophet, and the psalm, you'd never come up to this conclusion. But this is what he's doing. He's going to get him ready to gather all things together into one in Christ Jesus. See, mature kingdom thought is made known when you can summarize what you see. A person will say, I know, I know a lot, I just don't know how to say it. No, that's not a sign you know a lot. I know I just take too much time to say it. No, that's a sign you don't know a lot, not that you know a lot. When you know a lot, you're able to squeeze it down and make a succinct statement. That's why Paul stands out the way he does. He makes these statements over and over again. You go through his epistles, he'll take a great body of truth, he'll compress it down into one succinct statement. God's making him 
himself known. He's glorifying himself in this. Yes. And that he might gather in one all things in Christ. That's where they're seen most clearly. That's right. And that's where God is glorified to the greatest extent, is in Christ. So as all these things are brought together in Christ, they're also brought together in a manner so that God can be known. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, this contrasts significantly with the thought, you'll know the will of God for your life. All right, this, <laughs> that doesn't sound like much when you lay it alongside, alongside this. When you comprehend the parts properly, then you can state the whole. See, there's a lot of people, they know a lot of details, but they, they can't put them together. Mm -hmm. But God here puts it together for us, yeah. so we don't have to spend our lifetime yeah. trying to figure out what God's doing in salvation. He, he, he reveals it. Uh -huh. I'm just targeting the time when there isn't a world, there isn't a devil, there isn't flesh, there isn't blood. The day of judgment's over, and everything's going to be gathered together in Christ. Well, so what now, though, how do you feel about things that can't obvious, obviously can't be associated with Christ? Well, you begin to shed them off. <laughs> you begin to shed them off because they're not going to fit in. They're going to be a distraction, see? They may, you may argue for their legitimacy and make good arguments for their legitimacy. But when you come time to die or Jesus comes, you'll see too late that the fact that they didn't fit in with Christ, that's what made them wrong to be an emphasis. Amen. You don't want the world to direct how you plan your life. They'll have all kinds of suggestions for you. Gather together into one. I like some of the versions the way they read it, summing up all things. So it'd be gathering together, be like, yeah, they all fit together. They all fit together. Bring all things together. Might come to a head. Here they are. Here they they come. To, they're all they're joined up up at the top, not at the bottom. At the bottom, they, it looks like they're separated, like a pair. But as they move toward God, they eventually head up in Christ Jesus. He's going to unite all things. Now, if we were to ob obscure this statement, gather together all things in one in Christ. As I have said, believers could never conclude that that's what God's doing. <laughs> you say, what about all the calamities in, that in the world? He's, they all have tied in with this too. See, calamities, for some people, disconnect them yeah. with the temporal. See, it's all working to that end. The God is gradually stripping away all other things that inhibit you. He's going to gather everything together in Christ, and whatever doesn't integrate with Christ or fit with Christ won't be in him. Mm -hmm. See, the fact that it's in him means that it's harmonious with Christ and fits him with him. The truth of the matter is that men, for instance, have learned to live with division. Here God's talking about gathering everything together. That's, that's the opposite of division, but men have learned to live with division. Even in Christendom, they've learned to live with division. They'll say it's wrong, but they still live with division. <laughs> they'll, they'll say, well, I'll forget about the division. I'll pretend like it's not there. No, you can't live with division because God's purpose, there isn't going to be any division. In the world to come, there's not going to be any division. Not even between angels and men and cherubim and seraphim. And, they're all going to be joined together in Christ, everything gathered together in one. So division... Wherever division exists, flesh has crept in. That's what's happened. The impropriety of division is seen in the revealed objective of God to gather together all things in one. This, if that's all you knew right there, you'd know division's wrong. Christ isn't divided. Let it be clear that everything mentioned thus far in Ephesians 1 is in order to the realization of this that we just read. And I'll name them again. I think there's eight of them. Provide all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, choosing us in Christ before the world began, being holy and without blame before him in love, predestinate us 
under adoption, making us accepted in the beloved, having redemption and the forgiveness of sins, abounding toward us in all wisdom and prudence, making known the mystery of his will. Yeah, eight things. All of those things are in order to what we just read. Amen. Those are, in other words, you, God cannot reach that goal without these happening. So now you want to know, do you not, if you're participating in these things here, are you accessing, are you accessing all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? See, that's the thing you've got to think about. Do you have confidence you've been chosen in Christ? Do you, do you sense your unanimity with Christ? Do you? And are you advancing and holy and without blame before him in love? And the rest of the things there that, you, that are mentioned. All of those are what is, are, is God managing the process. <laughs> He's managing the process that will conclude in everything being gathered together in Christ. Oh, I'm sure that's evident enough. All things gathered together in Christ. There's only one place where all legitimate things can be gathered. It's not in the church. It's not in the institution. It's not in you personally. It's in Christ. That's where it is. I say legitimately because there are some things that can't be joined in Christ. Wheat and tares can't be joined. Spirit and flesh can't be joined. Sin, faith and unbelief, good and evil, the righteous and the unrighteous, the truth and the lie. See, they can't be. They can't be joined together in Christ. So what do you suppose it looks like if men try and join them together here? And they do. Men try and join these things together. They can't be joined together. That's why Jesus rebuked some of the churches in the Revelation because they had things that just didn't fit in. They left their first love. That didn't fit in with God's objective. Had some that were dead. That didn't fit in with God's objective. Had some that allowed a false prophetess to lead the servants of God astray. That didn't fit in. Had others that entertained the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That didn't fit in. Had some that were lukewarm, that didn't fit in. See, whatever doesn't fit in won't be brought together into one in Christ Jesus. Amen. All joined together. Whoever, whatever cannot find a place and expression mm -hmm. in Christ cannot be included as all things. Mm -hmm. See, things that are in Christ can be expressed. They don't have to be kept secret. They can be told. In Christ, we're told there's neither Jew nor Greek nor bond nor free nor male nor female. See, we taste of it. We taste of it now. People from different backgrounds, different cultures, but they're made one. There's no, there's no culture in Jesus, different cultures in Jesus. Being in Jesus has a culture of its own. Amen. See, spiritual life is a culture of its own. Yeah. The scripture speaks of a culture, independent culture from the world. There's not things in the Bible that are driven by human culture. There's a special culture. Why? Because God's gathering everything together in one in Christ. It's reflected in, in the scriptures, reflected in conversion, and he tells you that's the intent. Now I'm gonna, he says, I'm going to unite things in heaven, things on earth. Whew, that's, a, that's an ambitious undertaking. Generation has constantly made this error about culture. That's right. That's because right. The Roman Catholic Church adapted yeah. Yeah. the truth and they're so to culture again and again. Yeah. And so the truth was swallowed up. Yeah. And it still does. The church still, still doing it. it. They preach, preach about it. Bible colleges teach about the importance of adapting to the culture yeah. that you're in exactly. and so forth and so on. And we understand some of that to some degree. But no, we're, we're extracting people from the culture. That's of the right. Earth. This is the thing them in the culture of heaven. that they overlook, Brother Gene, is that there is a kingdom culture. Yes. There is a culture that we all partake of, yes. and it makes for oneness yes. in us. Amen. So we should not expect now that 
the tremendous investment that God himself has made in salvation and that Jesus has made and is making, we should not expect that to yield some kind of small results. Those who labor much get much. That's even more so applicable to God himself. Now think of this. He's going to bring together everything, all things, in heaven. <laughs> well, a, we don't know everything is in heaven. We know a lot of things in heaven. I'll name a few of them here. We're going to bring these together now. This part things on earth, things in heaven. Let's take the things in heaven. Well, the whole family in heaven. The hope laid up for you in heaven. Invisible things. He made things visible and invisible. Reconcile things. We have a master in heaven. We have a better substance in heaven. We have an inheritance in heaven. John says there is in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy and the Holy Ghost, First John 5, 7. The Father which is in heaven. The Lord Jesus is in heaven. He ascended into heaven. We have a new body that's waiting for us in heaven. Things in heaven of which the tabernacle were a type. Type of things in heaven. See, though they're there in heaven. Mount Zion's in heaven. City of the living God's in heaven. Heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, God the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, Jesus the media of the new covenant, the blood of sprinkling, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, to name a few. There's a few of the things in heaven. They're in heaven. They're going to be gathered together in one with things on earth. <laughs> things on earth. Remember Jesus said one time, you'll see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> you see? Hey, we're going to be weighed one. See, we're joined together. Things on earth. What do we, what do we have on earth? <coughs> well, here's some things on earth. Those who are alive and remain when Jesus comes, they'll be, they'll be gathered mm -hmm. up together into one. Our bodies will be raised from the grave and put on immortality. The nature itself and the impersonal creation will be liberated from the bondage of corruption and it'll be, it'll be joined together with us. They groaned with us while they were on earth and they're going to rejoice with us and they gathered together. So see, there's, it's marvelous. God's, God's preserving something in his in work with his people on earth. He's preserving something on earth is going to be blended together with what's in heaven. <laughs> what a thought, huh? That's a blessed thing. That it, it, not only personalities, but the benefits and provisions. And who has any remote idea how extensive this is? But that God's that's God's purpose. He separated the heaven and the earth at creation. See that. Now in in redemption, He's bringing everything into one. Extracting from the earth what's adaptable. Well, it says, even in him. <clears throat> Gather together even in him. Some of the versions read, and rightly so, under one head, even Christ. That is, he'll be the administrator of the whole, mm -hmm. whole thing. Under the Messiah's headship. Mm -hmm. Then Christ would be the head of everything. To be with him in Christ forever. Unified through Christ. Now we understand that actually Christ is the head over all things now. But it's for the church. That's, that's the catch there. He is. There's nothing that's not put under Jesus' feet. There remains nothing that's not put under his feet. It's all put under his feet. But now he's administrating the control of adversarial things and the use of proper things, he's doing that for the church. He's been given to the church in this capacity. He's head over everything. He's the head over the angels that minister to us. He's the head over the angels that fight against us. 
See, he's the head over all the prince of over all of the blessings that have been put in heavenly places. He's the administrator of all the wisdom and so forth. And he's the administrator of all the enemies. Mm -hmm. He's over everything now. Amen. But there, but now everything isn't one. Mm -hmm. He's one, but everything under him is not one. There's wheat and tares and good fish and bad fish and wicked and righteous. Yeah. But that's not where it's going to end, brethren. Amen. Don't get used to living with the ungodly. Yeah. It says, come, we're headed for a place when you'll diligently consider the place of the wicked, and you'll not find them at all. Here, death appears to be the final conqueror. That's how it looks. But when he gathers together all things in Christ, we'll look for death, and it won't be there. It'll be gone. But see, none of those things that are gone when we're gathered in together into one, None of those things, it will be confirmed to us, were able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Why not? Because God was administrating yeah. this whole process of salvation. Mm -hmm. Your soul is, in a sense, your soul is in your hands, but in a bigger sense, you're in his hands. Amen. See? Amen. And that, that he's administrating this salvation. Oh, that men could see this? Mm -hmm. That they could just see it clearly? That God, through Christ, is bringing many sons to glory. He's administrating the whole process. The whole thing he's ordained, how it should end up. Not I hope it ends up that way. That's the way it's going to end up. He's governing the thing Amen. all along. And what you do in, when you're born again, you become governable. That's, right. <laughs> That's what happens. And you become part of Christ, who is, who is the governor among the nations. Scripture that our lives are hid yeah. in Christ. Yes, amen. That's it. Well, that's a wonderful text. I'll tell you to, to consider and to ponder. So, our text is not speaking of subduing inimical forces, although that will be happened. That will, that, it's before it's all concluded, he's going to make all his Christ's enemies his footstool. I mean, that's, it's going to be like public going to be made known. But what this work has all been about, it's not been about subduing the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's been about bringing the sons home to glory and gather them together with some other personalities mm -hmm. that you've had to do with indirectly while you were here. Yeah. Those seraphim, you know, mm -hmm. call the four living creatures, yeah. and, and the 24 elders, an innumerable company of angels, and who knows... We're all going to be joined together in Christ in one. And that's what salvation is all about, brothers and sisters. Amen. It's about getting us ready for that time. Amen. All right, and if you have something you'd like to add tonight. Yeah, Brother Given, as, we, um, <coughs> as a person is brought to, or, or given to understand these things more perfectly, they, they have, they, it creates a greater joy in becoming a part of the process oh, to where you, 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 you actually you, you anticipate your next yeah. advancement yeah. in the kingdom. Amen. And you don't know how it's going to effectuate in you. You don't really understand how, but you're, you're anticipating it. Amen. And when it, when it does come, you say, uh, you enter right into this it with joy. That. This is that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I know this shall turn out to my salvation. <laughs> Something that may have seemed like it was evil. That's right. That's and right. It, it turned around. <laughs> Only God could do that. See, that's what we want everybody to be able to say. Mm -hmm. I know this shall turn out to my salvation. Yes. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. See? Amen. See why it's important not to... <laughs> question like God's sovereignty and God's choosing and God's predestinated and God working in you. It's, that's why it's important not to let anyone lead you to question that. You may not have all the answers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you've got enough said about it. You can take hold of it. You can trust God Amen. to administer this thing to the end. Amen. Yeah. Well, that's glorious. Sister Barbara. I was considering this uh, portion of gathering together all things in one. And you mentioned all legitimate things. And I, I thought that there was a, a great judgment made when the Lord will gather 
something to the exclusion of another. Mm -hmm. That that's an evident judgment there, just the exclusion, and and sometimes <coughs> a lot more can be made manifest in our joining ourselves to one thing to yeah. the exclusion of another. Amen. Much more than words could express otherwise. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I thought about that very thing. I remember. Um, Back when I first started thinking about this verse, when I read gather all things, I was thinking all things as in everything in the in the world and I couldn't I, I couldn't reconcile that in my mind. But when Paul said all things, he wasn't considering what was outside. That's right. Mm -hmm. That because right. it counted didn't count. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes with Mike manufacturing there's um, there's waste if you ma manufacturing <laughs> something out of wood or metal or even plastic or whatever there's part of the raw material you, that you get you don't use all of it some of it ends up being waste mm -hmm. and that's kind of like this what what God's gathering together in Christ is all the things that he's reserved for that's himself right. that he's chosen mm -hmm. Uh, all the things that are part of His purpose, those are the things that are gathered together in Christ. Yes. That that goes across all the boundaries of time and across the boundary yeah. of heaven and earth. And uh, that'll be a very great gathering. Amen. 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 There'll be no vessels under dishonor. That's right. They won't be gathered. They were in the house. Mm -hmm. well, they won't be gathered. <laughs> There'll be some fish in the net. They won't be gathered together. Yeah. yeah, and some servants in the household. Yeah, when you're looking at this, it's also a blessing to see as we we are working out our um, own salvation with fear and trembling. We are still fighting. We are, but when you step back and look at it, you see how the, the Lord is in. He's taking care. Of, I mean, He's doing. He's doing this work. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I understand. I would take it for granted that. We just sit back and relax. No, we're we're part of this work, but it does uh, give you um, strength and assurance to see that God is working. Amen. Out. Just as Job, you know, we look back at the time of Job. It looked like everything was out of control, but it was not. God was had a purpose with that whole situation, and he he was going to bring it to a, a conclusion that showed His glory. Amen. And, he, and this is what's happening here. Right now, we look like. If you look at the news and stuff, it looks like everything's chaos. But here, as we're talking tonight, this is God's working it all out. To the event, at the end, God's going to be shown for being glorious. And He's going to be, uh, all this is going to be made known that His people, this is a point that His people are going to be able to come up and, sh and shine. And we're all going to come together perfectly. One, That's right. One people. All the gathered ones are going to survive all this yeah. mm -hmm. calamity. <laughs> Amen. Yes, Brother Ricky. In light of the eternality of God's purpose, anything that's temporary, anything that can come to an end, can potentially be a distraction. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Whatever it may be, it can be all sorts of things. Amen. Mm -hmm. It looks like, look legitimate. Anything mm -hmm. that's a means can that, potentially be. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, because the means are going to be done away. That's Amen. right. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the revelation you've given of your purpose. We ask, Lord, for grace to be able to ponder this purpose frequently and with prolonged interest Amen. and insight. We thank you that you've divulged it to we know there have been many holy and righteous men that have not been vouchsafed this secret, but because of the removal of sin, you've let us behold it. Now help us to handle it correctly and to use it as a great encouragement and incentive to fight the good fight of faith and finish the race you've set before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.